I've been really appreciating this series on the lost ways. Uh, I don't know about you, uh, but just even the researching, the preaching, listening to Dion Garrett talk about it, uh, it's brought a depth and a richness to my own faith life in a way that I hadn't uh, anticipated. And this week especially, I feel like it's so timely what God is doing through this series as, as we face what's going on in the world, that as we're in the midst of this global pandemic, uh, this time where there, there's so much that needs to be done and people all around the world are doing all of these practical and necessary things to help uh, our neighbors and, and those that are more at risk uh, for this pandemic, that we who believe in God have been called to an extra additional step. We are called to do a totally impractical thing for the sake of our neighbor, which is be people of prayer. And so we're gonna to talk today about this particular ancient practice uh, of prayer, but before we do, just I think one note that's important to start with is that for Christians, prayer was never meant to be used as an excuse for inaction. That we are called to be people who pray, we do believe that prayer does things, and we'll be talking about that more in a little bit, but, uh, but it does things on top of the practical things that we can actually do. Uh, the Apostle John, uh, in one of his letters, says that the people who just say to someone else, oh, I'm sorry that you're struggling or hurting, I'll pray for you, and they don't do anything else. Uh, he says, those people do not have the love of God in them. Uh, and he encourages Christians to be people who don't just love with words and speech, with prayer, but also in action and in truth, that they, they put their money where their mouth is. And right now this week, there are a lot of practical things that we can be doing to put our money where our mouth is. We can be helping people with, um, with uh, social distancing, with being diligent about washing our hands. Uh, and by the way, if you have enough toilet paper, then just have enough toilet paper. Don't go out and buy more, okay? Uh, leave it for, for those that don't have any. Um, but in addition to all this, I wanna encourage us to think deeply and hard about this idea that prayer is something that is an important and powerful tool that we have to shape the world. And we're not making that up, that's something that Jesus himself modeled, that as God became a human being and lived a life, one of the things that he showed us was that that life was marked by being a man of constant prayer. Jesus would go out and in the crowds, he would heal people, uh, he would do all of the practical alleviation of their needs, but in between that, he was always spending time in communion with his Father in heaven. He'd go out before dawn off to a mountain, be up by himself, and he would just pray to God. In fact, he prayed so much that the disciples and other people finally just started asking him about it. They said, all right, what is going on with this prayer thing? What do we need to know about prayer? Why do you do it as much as you do? And it's in that moment, that question that they ask, that is our text for today. So in Matthew 6, as Jesus is teaching them all of the different things that those who follow him will do and look different from others, this is what he says. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, Go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you even ask him. There are a few things to note about what Jesus says here. The first is that phrase that I highlighted, when you pray, when you pray, when you pray. See, some of the ancient practices that we've talked about here uh, in this series are things that are meant for some people for a season. That sometimes it's good to fast. Sometimes it's good to maybe disrupt your comfortable life and go on a pilgrimage and, and see how God meets you there. But this lost way, prayer, is not a sometimes thing. It's, a, it's an all the time thing. It's a, a thing that he didn't say, if you do it if you pray, on occasion, if you should happen to pray, what he's saying is when you pray, it's something that we should be doing and it's an expectation uh, for all of us. But there was another phrase in there that I thought was really interesting because I've seen it pop up in several of the texts that we're using for this ancient practices uh, set of things. He says this about the Pharisees, the ones who pray on the street corners in public. He says, they have received their reward in full. And that looks kind of like a judgment or a condemnation uh, by Jesus towards the Pharisees. But I think he's actually just saying something uh, kind of objectively true. That these practices that we're looking at, these lost ways, God gave them to us for a reason. It's because they're actually good for us. 
And whether you use them for a faith goal or not, you will find benefit if you do these things. And in fact, we've seen that for all of these practices, right? That fasting seems to have a lot of uh, health benefits to it, and, and it's one of the prevailing trendy things for people to do for their health these days, that fasting can be healthy whether you're doing it for spiritual reasons or not. Or even this idea of pilgrimage, this, this truth that walking is good for anybody. Like there's no one that walking isn't good for if you're able to do it. Uh, and even people who go on pilgrimages, it's, there's been a rise of, of secular people going on pilgrimages for their own reasons of self-discovery. Uh, they're writing books about that. You know, Cheryl Strayed's writing about this. And, uh, and yet what you see is they are finding it. They're actually getting a benefit from pilgrimage, even though they're not doing it in the name of God or to connect more with God. It's beneficial in and of its own self. And prayer is, interestingly enough, the same way. There are scientific studies that seem to show that people in hospitals who are recovering from surgery or sickness, if they are prayed for, they have quicker recovery times and, and, more, um, and a higher percentage of recovery. Uh, but what's interesting is it doesn't really matter what the faith of the person is or the faith of the person doing the prayer. There's just something about this act of, of speaking with, with intentionality to someone, being mindful about someone's state of being that seems to have health benefits. Again, regardless of whether you're doing it in the name of Jesus or not. And so there's this picture here that all of these things are actually things that God knew were good for the human being. That our condition is such that fasting, walking, praying, they're, they're good for us aside from any additional benefit, spiritual benefit that we would, we would get out of them. And that's what Jesus is alluding to here. He says, look guys, this is a good thing to do. You're gonna have a reward. If you want the, the Pharisees, if you want respect from others, all right, you'll get that. If you want health benefits, you'll get that too. But then he offers us a path to something better. He says that if we do these for his sake, if we do them because of something that we want uh, to connect with him, we actually get some additional benefits. We, there's something powerful that happens in that moment. One of the other things that's stuck out to me in this series is that all of these ancient practices are really powerful things to do. They, they really do come with these amazing benefits uh, for us. And one of the questions that I've gotten from a couple of people since we've done the series is, why hasn't the American Protestant Church uh, focused on these practices more? Like, why are they lost ways? If they're so powerful, if they're so beneficial, why don't we emphasize these more in our church tradition? And the answer, I, I think, is that because they're so powerful, it's too easy for them to become the end goal in and of themselves. See, the intent of these practices is that they are best ways to connect ourselves with God. But what happens is because they're so effective, we, we lose the fact that they were the means to an end. The end is relationship with God and whatever uh, helps that, whatever, whatever um, blesses and benefits that is a good thing. But then what ends up happening with these practices is they become the thing that you do for them in and of themselves, for the sake of themselves. If you say, oh, we should just pray uh, because that's a righteous thing to do, not because I'm connecting with God more, but just because it's righteous. Or we fast because, oh, that shows how holy I am, and, and we just fast because that's what church people are supposed to do. And when that happens, they actually become no longer beneficial, uh, and perversely, they end up being for our own detriment, not for our own health. Martin Luther described it this way in his Heidelberg Disputation. He said this, he said, although the works of man always seem attractive, and good, and so again, he's talking about these holy, pious, righteous things. It's a good thing to pray, it's a good thing to fast, it's a good thing to, to serve your neighbor. He says, for all that the works of man can seem attractive and good, they are nevertheless likely to be mortal sins. Because what he's pointing out is the better a practice is, the more likely it is that we're gonna put our hope and our trust in the act itself. And we're gonna think that it's the act of praying that saves our life not the God whom we're praying to. We're gonna think fasting is the thing that gives us all sorts of health and spiritual benefits instead of that it's the thing that helps provide more connection between us and God himself. And so I think this truth is why uh, modern Christianity has had kind of a love-hate relationship with some of these lost ways, that, that we see some of the danger in them and so we reject them, but then we lose out on the fact that they were in fact given to us by God as a great and powerful, effective way for us to connect with him. So if we are gonna connect with him, if that's truly our desire and our hope, then let's look more deeply at this idea of prayer, not, not because prayer itself is the thing we worship, but because prayer is a way that we receive what Jesus wants us to receive. So he continues on in Matthew, 
Uh, he says this. So if you're doing it for the right reasons, not like the Pharisees, not, not for the, the reward they want to receive, but if you're doing it for the right reasons, this then is how you should pray. And look what he says. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I think it's good to point out, in case you didn't know, that the Lord's Prayer is something that the church has said for a long time. It's something that we say pretty regularly around here, and it's not something we made up. It's, uh, it's something that we got directly from Jesus himself. And there are some promises implicit in that prayer. It's, it's so simple. It's just six petitions, the Lord's Prayer. And yet, in the simplicity, it's, it's making two broad statements about life in general and about what prayer offers us. See, to summarize the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is saying that when we pray, we get two things. That first, prayer connects us to the person of Christ himself. Prayer is the way that, that we forge a, a lifeline to God. We, we get out of a track that we're in by ourselves and we get into a track that God wants us to be in with him. And then in addition to that, prayer connects us to the power of Christ. He says that when we ask for things through prayer, they, they can happen. That the, the very same divine power that God uses to, to change the world, we have access to when we pray. And so when we ask God to give us our daily bread, when we ask him to bring his will on earth as in heaven, there's power in that. And here's the thing, I believe that Jesus is true and I believe that I want both of these things. I want to be more connected with the God of the universe, the one who made everything, who saved me, who says he loves me more than his own life. I wanna know that person better. I wanna be more connected with him. And I want to have divine power. I wanna have power to transform myself and to transform the world. I would like to be the kind of person that when the world is panicking, I uh, can keep my head about me while others around me are losing theirs and blaming it on me. I wanna be that kind of person who is larger than, more capable than the things that life throws at me. And, and, and Christ is saying that prayer is the way I get there. Or I even really wanna be that person who has power to transform others, to be a person of influence and impact on people around me. And Jesus is saying that prayer is the way that we do it. There's this amazing moment in the Gospels where Jesus has empowered his disciples to go out and do his ministry. And they go around and they're healing everybody and they're casting out demons. And then they get to this one guy and they go to cast out a demon, which they've gotten pretty used to by now, and it doesn't work. They can't cast out the demon. And so they go back to Jesus and they bring Jesus in. They say, Jesus, we, we, we tried, we, we did the thing and, and the demon can't be cast out. And Jesus looked at the situation and he said, oh, this is the kind of demon that can only be cast out by prayer. And then without another word, Jesus cast out the demon. And the disciples kind of scratched their head at this. Well, you just said it can only be cast out by prayer and then you didn't, you didn't say a prayer, Jesus. You just cast him out. And the implication that Jesus was trying to make to his disciples he's making to us today too is he'd already been praying. He lived a life of such constant prayer that he didn't need to make a new prayer or say something special about this demon. He just tapped into the praying that he was already doing. This lifestyle that he already had of living in constant prayer and that was where Jesus found the power to cast out a demon. And that's power that he wants to make available to us. And I want it, I'll tell you that. But here's the thing, as much as I believe those two things are true, I believe that prayer connects us to Christ, I believe that prayer gives us access to his power, the, the reality is, and I just have to be up here on stage and tell you that, I don't pray very much. I don't pray as much as I think I should uh, as a leader in the church. And I don't pray enough to, to maybe accomplish these kinds of things that Jesus is suggesting that I would receive if I were to pray more. So the question is why, why don't I pray? For me, it boils down to a few things that, that trip me up. You know, one is we're just, we're all so busy, right? I just, I feel like I don't, I don't have the time in my busy, overscheduled day to pray. I don't know if you guys were timing it, but you know how long the Lord's Prayer takes to say? It takes like almost a minute to recite that thing, the whole thing. I just, I don't have time for that, guys. It's, it's too hard. Or the other thing is I think maybe I don't, I don't have sufficient expertise 
I think there's this idea, again, I've been talking with people about some of these ancient ways, this idea that, oh, that's, that's what the saints are for. Let the saints do the praying for us. They're closer to Jesus. They're better at it than I am. Leave it to the professionals. And yet that's not the picture Jesus paints either. And in fact, prayer is so important. The need for prayer in this world is so big. It's too important to be left to the professionals, guys. Jesus didn't say, when you let the professionals pray, here's how it should go. He said, no, you, all of you, every one of you who follows me, he invites us, he needs us, he, he asks us to be people of constant prayer ourselves. And what I'm realizing is, I think this idea of an expert at prayer is a myth. Because if I'm someone who does this for a living, I'm a leader in the church and I don't feel like an expert in prayer, I feel like it's awkward or I don't always know the right words, then I promise you there are no experts in prayer outside of Jesus himself, that we're all fumbling along, we're all trying to do this thing and figure it out as we go. But I think the third thing that, that keeps me from praying more actively, that keeps me from being a man who lives a life of constant prayer like I'd like to be, is that I struggle deep down to believe that prayer is actually effective and powerful. I've had the experience, and I'm sure you have too, where I prayed for the thing, and it was important, and it mattered to me, and it didn't happen. And so then you try to keep praying, even in, in that despair, and you know, well, I know I'm supposed to, and so you, you pray out of obligation uh, and guilt and expectation. Well, it's something we're supposed to do. Jesus ordered us to do it. But there's only so long you can keep that up. There's only so many times you can pray and go to your knees when you don't feel or see like anything is happening. And obligation can keep you going for so long, but eventually I peter out. And as I was researching and thinking about this and praying about this this week, an image came from one of the, the people I was reading and it was really helpful and powerful to me. He made this point about prayer, but he, but he connected it to something in our real world. Uh, you guys can all picture a rose bush, right? In fact, I mean, here's, here's one. I mean, they're, they're gorgeous, right? The rose is the, the most beautiful of all flowers. It's why they can charge so much for them at the florist compared to the carnations, you know, which has done me badly in my marriage relationship because I, I do the cost-benefit analysis and I think, oh, carnations are like a quarter of the price of roses. She'll be just as satisfied with those. She is not uh, as satisfied with those. The roses are the way to go, which is why they can mark them up so much. Uh, in fact, when my wife and I bought our first house, there was uh, this signature piece to it. It had a giant rose bush right next to the front door. And it was part of what made the house look so appealing. And so we bought the house, not just for the rose bush, for other reasons. And then I discovered something to my dismay. As beautiful as that rose bush looked when we bought the house in spring, do you know what rose bushes look like the other 10 months out of the year? They look like this. And so, two months out of the year, we had this beautiful rose bush outside of our front door uh, that welcomed people in. The rest of the time, we had this mass of thorns, like threatening everybody that tried to come into our house. And the fact is, our life is like a rose bush. And prayer is the tool that we use to make our garden flourish. But the thing about a rose bush is that you spend all of this time and effort. You have to water it and you have to prune it and you have to nourish it and put, you know, put the right stuff in the soil. And you do all of this work on your rose bush and for 10 months as you're doing that work, it looks like this. And there's no fruit, there's no benefit, there's no obvious uh, connection that gardening like prayer does not have a one-to-one -one ratio of the effort that you put into it and the blooming that you get at the end of it. But think about how silly it would be for me to come into the house and say, well, hon, I watered the thorns, didn't do anything. I guess watering is useless. It's, it's not effective, doesn't do anything. Or honey, I, I pruned the thorn bush again, and yep, it's still thorns, now they're just slightly shorter thorns. Great. But if we would just wait, if we would faithfully do the actions of gardening, there will come a point, maybe in a few weeks, maybe in a few months, where that thing is going to bloom and it is going to be effervescent. This is what our prayer life is and this is how the power of prayer works. That you don't necessarily make a prayer and immediately see something, but that you're laying the seeds, you're watering the ground, you're tilling the soil, you're, you're trimming the branches. 
And little by little, after a life of daily doing of those things, there will be a flourishing in your garden. Here's the problem. I am a terrible gardener. And I mean that in every sense of the word, both literally and spiritually. It is not appealing to me in the slightest, this idea that I need to spend all of these hours on my knees in dirt with a trowel in the hopes that maybe at some point in the future, something will bloom. I'd rather just do some nice, lovely rocks instead. They'll look good, weed them once in a while, it's so much easier. And it's the same with the spiritual life. That I, I, I love to hear this idea that, that my prayers are a thing that, that slowly but steadily are working towards some future uh, blooming and, and flowering in my life, but it's such an inconsistent and a vague hope that it, it, I just get beat down again. It's hard for me to actually think that going to my knees every day is gonna change anything. And then I get stuck in this, uh, in this cycle of, of guilt and despair. Like I, I try for a while and I pray for a while and then, then uh, I, I'm not able to keep it up because I didn't see any fruit. And then I feel bad about it and then I feel despairing about it. But then I pull myself up and say, no, I gotta try again. And I try and I just start the cycle all over. And in the midst of that negative despairing cycle, I was reminded and I wanna remind you of the words of John Kleinig, this, this truth about these gardens that are constantly being tended of our own lives. This is what John Kleinig said. He said, we are not left by ourselves to find our way in prayer. Jesus helps us at every step. Long before we ever began to pray, he was praying for us and our salvation. Whether we pray or don't pray, whether we are asleep or awake, he is constantly praying for us. However, he does not just pray for us, he prays with us so that we can join him in his praying. This was the reminder I needed this week, that ultimately I am not the gardener of my own garden, that Christ has been watering and tending and pruning and doing life-bringing work in my life before I even knew it was happening. He was a man of prayer and still is, as he sits at the right hand of his father, he is still praying for us and our salvation. This is the man who, while he was on earth, got up in the morning to pray, who while he was being whipped and mocked and led to the cross, he prayed in that moment, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And he has been praying for you since before you were born. And I promise you that every good thing you've had in your life, every moment of flowering or blooming in your garden has happened because your holy gardener was praying for you. And now that can break the cycle of guilt and obligation and legalism. As Kleinig says, if we, ever, if, if we pray or if we don't pray, if we're awake or even if we're sleeping, those prayers of Christ are powerful and effective in your life and mine. But then he invites us to garden with him. And I don't know about you, but that is so much more appealing to me to know that there's a garden that's gonna bloom regardless of my efforts, but that I'm just invited to participate in it. And now all of the doubts and all of the fears and all of the worries that, that I might plant the seeds wrong, you know, even right now, I'm sure hoping those seeds that we just planted last week come up. I'm really praying that they will. And I don't know, because I'm a terrible gardener. I trust the people that got them for us. They know what they're doing, I hope. Instead of it having to be a thing that we do out of, out of fear or concern or trying to build something better in our garden, we're just invited to participate in the work that Christ has already been doing in our lives. Prayer can be a thing we do out of joy for joining into this act with God. And it's not only something that we join into with God for the sake of that we're gonna get some, some power and some connection with him. We're also then joining with all the other people, the bride of Christ, the people who are praying now and the people who have been praying long before. Robert Benson, uh, another uh, Christian writer, has this theory that the thing that has sustained the church for 6,000 years is that people have been praying at every generation without break. He says this. He says, for 6,000 years, the faithful began their days with the cry of, Lord, open our lips. They began their days with prayer. And together, the different generations have formed a great river of prayer that has rolled across the centuries 
offered by the unknown and the unseen saints, people just like you, just like me. The histories never remembered their names, and yet they contributed to this great river of prayer that sustained the church. And now it is our turn. This river that's been flowing for millennia continues to flow today, and we're invited to wade into it ourselves, to continue that progression that, that went long before us and will continue long after us. We get to join in the tide of prayer with God and with all the body of believers. So from that perspective, what does it look like practically to live a life in constant prayer. When we've walked away from guilt or obligation or this idea that, that we have to do something to, to fix and, and, and sustain our own gardens, what can it look like to be people who, who willingly, joyfully wade into that river of prayer? And I got a few thoughts on that for you as we, as we close up. The first is that I had to break through something myself a couple of years ago and it's changed my life. I promise you it has. This idea of actually intentionally tracking my habits that starting about two and a half, three years ago, I picked a maximum of four things at any given time. A habit that I said, this is something that would be beneficial, important in my life. And so uh, my Bible reading time was one of them. Uh, exercising has been one of them. And the, the other two have kind of rotated in and out. And, and right now it's prayer. And when, what's been amazing is when you don't approach it with guilt and condemnation, when you're not gonna beat yourself up every time that you mess up, but you simply put something down on paper and say, I wanna, I wanna reinforce this habit. And every time I do it, I get to color in a little box. It's childlike and it's silly, and yet I am more motivated by coloring in little boxes than I ever would have thought. And it doesn't become something that I have to beat myself up over, it just becomes something that is delightful to watch the boxes fill in as the month goes along to look back and be like, oh, and to see just, oh, and there it is, and there was another one, there was another one. And, and then when I don't do one, when I miss a day or a week or sometimes a few weeks, I approach myself the way St. Benedict approached his spiritual disciplines a few thousand years ago, which he said, every day, always, we begin anew. Every day is a blank slate. Every day is a fresh start. I don't worry about what, what boxes I colored in in the past. I only worry about today. Can I color in a box today? And more often than not, yes, I can. And then the next day I ask myself the same question and then slowly but surely I see the boxes fill in and this thing that used to be an opportunity for legalism and condemnation in my life now just becomes yet another moment of joy in my day when I get to open my, my journal and I get to see how that, those habits have filled in and also to reflect on how much my life is fuller and richer because I've been doing them. And so what I would encourage you now today, whether you use a habit tracker or a planner, uh, but is to pick a time, pick a place, and find one that'll actually work for you. Don't commit to be, you know, getting up at five in the morning to pray if you've never done that before. I'm promising you now it won't work. But pick a time, maybe 10 a.m. when you take your coffee break or maybe uh, at the end of the day, find a time that you know you can commit to. Write it down on your journal or if you use uh, you know, digital calendars like I do, may actually make an appointment on your calendar. And then in faith, make it a recurring appointment and see what happens when you actually carve out the time and the space, you're gonna find that it's so much easier than you ever thought it could be when you don't have to live in shame and guilt and obligation anymore. And so with that, here are three suggestions I would make for you to pick a time, pick a place, and then do one of these three things to become a person whose life is marked by prayer. First is just simply choose a single line of prayer that can accompany you throughout your day. This is how simple it can be. Here are a few suggestions for you. So the, the first one there, the top line, is called the Jesus Prayer. And the Eastern Orthodox tradition has been praying this prayer for 2,000 years. So simple. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. That's it. That's the whole prayer. Uh, or maybe there's a line of a song uh, the songs that we sing here, one of the cool things about them is that they are taken from scriptural lines or biblical truths. They come from the Bible. And because they're a song, they have this way of having a rhythm that can stick in your head for a while. Uh, for me, the one a few years ago was 10,000 Reasons. It has this line, bless the Lord, O my soul, O my soul. Worship 
his holy name. And when I first sang that song, that line would get stuck in my head and I finally just embraced it and I, I didn't try and get it out of my head, I just let it stay there. And I let this line be a mantra, something that I just let repeat over and over again in my mind throughout the day. And as I'm getting up and getting ready in the morning, what's in my mind? Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. And as I'm, as I'm making lunches, uh, as I'm commuting, just over and over again, bless the Lord, oh my soul, worship his holy name. And what's amazing is it doesn't take any extra time because you're not, you're not doing it separately, you're doing it as you go about your day. It's simple, it's one line. You can pick it, pick a, something that works for you. And another one that, uh, that I asked my wife, which was a line for her, and, and she loves the one from this new song, Reckless, um, Reckless Love, that, uh, that there's no mountain he won't climb up coming after me. And just that can be a thing that you repeat over and over again, that Christ is coming after you. He's breaking down every obstacle that separates you from him. And to just let that be this pervasive reminder that starts to transform your heart and mind throughout your day. That's how simple it can be. And what I promise is when you do that, you'll notice that you change. You have a whole different attitude. Now, some of you, maybe you listen to Joy FM all the time. That's nothing new for you. You're ready for that. Maybe you need a little extra step. Maybe you need to try throwing away the words completely. And just to carve out time daily to be quietly still with God. I know one of the things that trips me up and I think trips up a lot of people is this idea that we're not the prayer experts. We don't know the right things to say. And so let me give you an encouragement that comes from the Apostle Paul himself in Romans chapter eight. Paul says this. He says, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, in those moments where we don't know what God wants us to pray, we don't think we have the right words, the poetic words, the holy words. In that moment, the Holy Spirit shows up and prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And so maybe lean into that promise. Don't try to have the right words, don't try to do anything fancy or holy, but just sit there in silence with God and invite the Holy Spirit to groan with and for you and to trust that that moment of connection is as powerful as anything you could ever think to say. Or maybe you could try option C which is to commit to praying the hours of the day individually or as a family. And if you don't know about that, that's a, an ancient tradition where they actually designated uh, the times of day where, where Christians should stop what they were doing and they should take a few moments to pray. Uh, and in fact, I found an app this week that I love. It's called the Daily Prayer app. There's a picture of it. It's a beautiful app. And it just has four daily prayers, a morning prayer, a midday, evening, and then bedtime. And, and it takes you through these ancient rhythms where there's an opening and then a scripture reading and then you do the Lord's Prayer and then you close it out. And it, it's so simple and it's all written for you and every moment of every day has a different customized prayer that you can join into praying with others that are sharing in that app or that tradition. What's been amazing is my, my family and I uh, have, have tried it this week and I've been using it this week. It doesn't take long. Uh, if the scripture reading is a little long, it can maybe take up to about nine minutes. But the actual prayers themselves, you can do in about three minutes. And so when you think about that, three minutes of prayer time you know, with an additional six minutes of scripture reading time, that's nine minutes it takes to pray this, this moment of prayer. Guys, I spend more than nine minutes trying to figure out what to watch on Netflix every night. Just scrolling through, oh, that looks kind of good, that looks good, and then I look at my watch and it's been 20 minutes and I haven't even watched anything. Could have watched a whole show in that time. I've got nine minutes in my day. And I think maybe you do too. And so maybe just pick one time, pick maybe just the morning prayer or just the bedtime prayer or maybe just the midday if lunch is probably the, the best way for you to carve something out. Or maybe pick two of them or all four of them if you're really feeling your oats. But pick something and just try it, go through it. And I think what you'll notice is whether you're only doing it one time a day, up to four times a day, I think you'll notice that the, the spaces in between start to be different as well. That when we become people who commit to this habit of praying in whatever form it is, again, none of these are better than another, it's just which one seems like it fits you better in the season or which one Christ is prompting you to do in this moment. But when you do any of these, when, when you commit to this habit of prayer, not only do your prayers change, but the rest of your day changes too. And so I encourage you to join with me in, in trying to embrace this very lost way of our church, to trust that Jesus is doing something in your life and to join in the prayers of your gardener as he is blooming many things in your garden. Would you pray with me now? 
Lord God, I give you thanks that you know how you wired us and you designed us to live in certain ways for our own good, not, not for your own selfish vanity. And so Lord, right here, right now, I thank you that you are a God of prayer, that you sent your son to pray for us and that he has been praying for our salvation, that he has been tending to our gardens our entire lives. And so Lord, right now, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be powerful in our lives, that you would, with your divine power, prompt us to take a next step of prayer ourselves. Not out of necessity or guilt, but simply out of the joy of joining with you in a mighty and powerful work, trusting that the more we walk with you in this way, the more our lives will be transformed and the more of an impact we will make on a desperate and hurting world. We pray this in your holy name, amen. One of the other ancient practices that we um, regularly practice, put into practice here at Pathfinder, is to say a corporate confession. Now, confession is sometimes a word that's loaded with a lot of baggage. There's duress or heaviness or a lot of shame maybe with confession. The word confession simply just means to affirm with or to speak with or agree with. See, when we confess together, not only are we admitting something with one another, but we're just speaking out the truth that God already sees. You can put on a face or an act for people in your life to keep them from the reality of your life, and maybe that works. With God, he sees it all. And so there's no point in hiding. He invites us instead just to say, to agree with, to speak the same of, of what he already sees and knows about us. And there's something really powerful and freeing when we align ourselves with what God already sees, what he already says, what's already true. So right now, I invite you to join me in these words of confession. Pray with me. Listen to my words, Lord. Consider my lament. Hear my cry for help my King and my God, for to you I pray. In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my requests before you and wait expectantly. For you are not a God who is pleased with wickedness. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. Therefore, we humble ourselves before you. As Psalm 5 says, we have requests and things we bring to God and that there are things that keep us out of God's holy house and his temple. But Psalm 5 continues on to say this. It says, but I, by your great love, by your great love, I can come into your house. In reverence, I bow down toward your holy temple. God has removed all obstructions anything in your life that's kept you from his love, it's been from your side and he has steamrolled over it with the power of his love for you. And so receive his forgiveness of all of your sins, as well as anything that's kept you from embracing the fullness of his love for you. And in addition to just the words of proclamation, let me also remind you of what our Lord Jesus Christ did. That on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper he took the cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to his disciples and he said, drink of it all of you, this is my blood for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. In just a moment I'll be inviting people up but I wanna take a moment to say that if you're feeling overwhelmed by all of the news and everything that's been going on. And you wanna just take some time in this portion of the service to just sit where you are, to reflect and receive everything that God has for you. That's okay. 
Christ is present with you and he is praying for you and nourishing your garden as you speak. But I would also invite anyone uh, who is willing to come and receive his body and his blood that he gave us for our own spiritual and physical good, then our Lord wants you up here as well. So whether you sit or whether you come forward, our Lord's presence is here with us tonight and it is for you and for your good. Amen. Volunteers, you can come forward.